and welcome to our first book chat of 2024. Happy I'm Donna Jones. I know, right? Sorry, I'm Donna Jones Allward. This is Barbara Tanner Wallace, and Ooh. together we host Step Into the Story. We're authors and, of course, avid readers, and we love talking about historical fiction. Um, so welcome to 2024, Barb. <laughs> hey, good year. What, what's new? Um, not a lot. We were just talking about things. I am getting ready to go sailing in Florida, which is quite nice, given that we're talking about unsinkable. But uh, yeah, getting ready to go sailing. It's going to be very windy, so we're not sure we're taking the boat out the day we want to take it out. Um, yeah, we were talking before. And then you said, yeah, this is a, a great topic for today's show. Um, because I was saying that my one and only time in a sailboat, we capsized and I hated it because I hate, um, I don't actually like swimming in the ocean and we were in open water and, um, and I was like 14. So it was not my favorite thing. So as we go along with today's discussion, I can say that I relate more to Daphne than Violet. <laughs> we know what's funny is um, we sunk a boat. I, w I wasn't on it. My husband was, and it wasn't, and it was, the boat sunk, it hit, um, he got tied up in a lobster buoy and the wind threw him into this barge that was half sunken off in the, um, off of Massachusetts. There, if you go down the Southern Mass, there's a thing called Rooster Rock, but he hit it right. and it pushed the, the um, centerboard up into the boat. So they started taking on water and it, it took him a long time to get comfortable. I mean, he, my husband's been sailing since he was a little boy. And he said they took on water. The Coast Guard came and got him. The boat went down. And um, <laughs> the, there was a 14-year-old boy with them. It was uh, his friend and his friend's son. And I don't believe that boy has ever gone on a boat again. Like, he was terrified. And my husband said it, it took him a long time to get comfortable again. He's like, he could sail and he did it. But he was like, it still was always in the back of his head that he had this one mishap. And it was a yeah. spooky thing. You know, it was yeah. wavy and he didn't see the buoy and the buoy got tangled up and that was the end of it. Yeah. I was uh, I was out with my brother-in-law and, uh, you know, I trusted him completely, but still I had this unease about being, you know, in open water and it was a small boat. So uh, when we capsized, it was like, oops. And, uh, you know, I tried not to panic. He was really good about it. And like I said, I was really young, but, but I still, now that being said, I love the ocean. I love being on the water generally. Um, but the idea of capsizing in the ocean is not good. So, mm -hmm. did you have a life jacket up? Oh God, yeah. Oh, okay. Let's go say. Um, oh God, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's always wear your life jacket. We learned that. Yeah. lesson. Actually, I learned that lesson as a young girl. That was same, uh, same. And it's funny because now <laughs> I know we got to get to the book chat, but <laughs> we were out with a friend on his I think he had like a 17 footer and we were just on the lake like we were in open ocean I don't think I mean we've taken it on the ocean but um you know they'd be like oh we're just you know taking the kids tubing or whatever and I'd always have my life jacket on right and they'd give me such a hard time like oh look and they call me buoy because I'd be all like you know but my thing was always like you don't wear a life jacket because you can see the accident coming. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's there because accidents happen that you don't expect. So I always was just, you know, I'm a safety first girl. We are too. And I always answer not to bring the topic down, but the neighbor of a good friend of mine in high school, they had a summer house and her neighbor at the summer house was out um, in his motorboat one night and they hit something and he got knocked over and, never came up, didn't have a life jacket on. Yeah. And so I said that to my husband. He's like, oh, I'm never going to make fun of you for wearing a life jacket. And they have really nice, comfortable ones now. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I know, like, we wear our kayaking now, and we have paddling paddling ones, not, which are a Not at all like ones. the life jackets they had in the Titanic, which brings us to our book. Look at that. Yes, yeah, so let's get to our book chat. Okay, so today we're talking about Jenny Walsh's book, Unsinkable which pairs two stories. There's the story of Violet Jessup, who was a real person. Um, she was a nurse during World War I, but before that she survived the sinking of the Titanic and another boat, which, another boat accident. Like she, I think she survived like three before she even became a World War I nurse. Then yeah, it was weird. It was tons, and not to mention like all this other stuff. And it pairs it with um, Daphne, who was a fictional character. And she's during World War II, and she is um, on an, I guess we'd say an intelligence assignment with the resistance in France. Right. Yeah. So, 
yeah, it alternates, and the book alternates point of view. So between 1912, which is Violet, and, and into the 20s, too, with her, really. And then World War II with Daphne. And Violet works as a stewardess with the White Star Line, and uh, which is why she was on the Titanic and the Olympic before that. Um, and one, yeah. what I really liked about her was her love of the sea and the fact that, you know, she really made no bones about the fact that it was more her home than her actual family home in Ealing. And even after the Titanic sank, she went back to work on the sea um, because she was supporting her family. And, you know, she could have done other jobs, but honestly, the tips from the first class passengers made such a difference in her income that she just kept, um, she kept working as a stewardess and then once the war broke out of course in 1914 she becomes a bad so she becomes a volunteer um nurse and works uh works as a nurse for wounded men who are transported back to england um well then on the other hand you had daphne who was extremely well educated um had attended yeah. multiple universities she spoke multiple languages she's proficient in arabic german spanish French. French. I think they said six, and I can't remember all of them. And then she but, and she learns them as she goes. Right. She also she has a photographic or almost identic. Is it identic? Identic. Identic memory. Yeah. And she's an expert in art because so she works at an art gallery. She's, you know, she's completely opposite Violet in that sense. But she's recruited to work for the OSS or the Special Operations, the original Special Operations in World War Two. Um, yeah. And she, her, all you know about her is that her mother died when she was little and her father is extremely famous. He is a huge movie star turned director and she's been trying to get his attention her whole life because he's always ignored her. And um, instead she signs up for this to kind of impress him and she's immediately thrown into the war, like within days of signing up and getting her training. They're like, oh, you going in. <laughs> yeah, you're not even going to go do this. Like she was supposed to go do jump training and yeah. uh, they didn't even do that. They were like, nope, you're going in right now. And she was like, what? What the heck? <laughs> so actually, there was a really, um, really great scene where um, she gets her orders and she's like, oh, my God, I'm leaving tomorrow. And then they put her through a final test before she yes. leaves. And it was like, wow, like things are things are moving really quickly. But that also showed exactly how smart she was <laughs> and how good yeah. she was because she figured out sort of these context clues that, so when you would think most people would be terrified and she's confused and they've done all these you know psychological games and yes. she's still picking out things. She did a great job and you realize this woman knows what she's doing. Yeah. And she's, she thinks on her feet really well. And you know, it's funny though, because I was, as I was reading, I was kind of surprised to see the two storylines take place in two different time periods. Like I didn't expect that. Yep. And then the fact that there wasn't a clear link between the two characters. And we don't learn until quite late in the story what Violet's connection to Daphne is. But I actually found that when that happened, I thought it was really, really neat. Like I, I started liked to that. suspect it, I won't lie. I started to suspect Yeah, it. I, I um, didn't actually I actually didn't suspect that. I suspected something else. Um that was yeah, w which was really a little more far fetched is kind of what I expected. Um, but I was try I kept trying to piece it together and I wasn't getting it. Um, but which storyline did you like better? Because, you know, they're two very different storylines. Yeah. And I got to confess, I like Daphne's better. Um, you know, I, I think that Violet Jessup's life is astounding. Um, you know, it, it wasn't just that she survived a couple boat sinkings. This woman like almost died of tuberculosis. And she had scarlet fever. Yeah. And like they go through everything that happened. And her family, half her family died of illnesses. And her mother had a nervous breakdown. And she's her father died. She was a survivor. But Daphne, and Daphne was too, but I think what the difference in the storyline was that Violet's whole storyline was reacting to things that happened to her. And granted, they were pretty big things that happened to her. I mean, it wasn't like, yeah. oh, I stubbed my toe. It was, oh, I'm on this ocean liner that sunk and killed. 2000 people, but she was always reacting. Whereas Daphne was getting, was much more doing things. She was getting herself into situations and then getting herself out. She wasn't just letting things happen to her. So I think that that's why I liked it more. And I also liked 
Daphne's voice more, maybe because she did have a little snark in her. And yeah, she was, she could be saucy. Right. And I <laughs> like that. She didn't, wasn't always saucy to others, but her, a lot of her yes. POV and the way she was thinking, they were, I liked it. I liked how she thought. I got a kick out yeah. of it. And in some ways that kind of fit, you know, the time of being 20 years later than, yeah. than Violet. Um, I also gravitated toward Daphne's. And, but I think part of it was the whole danger and working with the resistance that pulled me forward. Um, because when you think about Violet, uh, even when she became a nurse, she was working in England, right? When, when men were shipped back for treatment, she wasn't in the thick of it on the front. And Daphne was, I mean, she was in danger a lot. And I mean, that's a great that's a great way to keep pace moving and that kind of thing. So, and I, I also put in my notes that I thought she was a really sparky character. Yeah, um, I really liked her for that. She could think on her feet. Uh, there's a scene where uh, she is, okay, it's, it's minor spoilery. There's a scene where she's caught <laughs> and she has to come up with a story, like on the spot kind of thing. And the first thing she does is pretend to faint and buy herself time. And it was just, yeah. Like, I just loved how she did that. Um, and, and it was really funny because all of that sparkiness was really in opposition or in contrast to um, the little girl who really just wanted her father's attention and acknowledgement. So I thought that was a really neat aspect of her of her character. Yeah, I really like that. And um, well, it's interesting because Violet was the character that earned the title Miss Unsinkable, which is the name of the boat, a, a book. And I'm going to hold it up. Yeah, right, the cover is really yes. cool. We both have we both have copies here. Yeah, the cover is really cool because you see the ship and the person. Yeah, I love and, the cover. Yeah, it's different. It, it's not like your usual um, historical fiction covers, which I thought was kind of nice. No, it's got the picture of the Titanic on it, and then um, and then you know the the woman in the the woman's um, silhouette. So I really um, like it. Yeah, and what? But I think that it applied to both of them, the title, because you know Violet was unsinkable because she was on ships that sunk and she kept surviving. But Daphne also kept surviving things, and it wasn't. Just, I know you, we were talking like she had her mishaps on the water, which there's a couple. There's one that's yep. really key, but she also survived getting caught. She survived the war. Like she yeah. was. They were both like they weren't phased by dis, by disaster happening. Yeah, you know, and we're unflappable in as well as unsinkable. I think that that's yeah, and it's, it's funny how these are brought together by two opposing points. So like Violet loves the sea, like I was saying before, and yeah. always gravitates toward it. And even when when you know things are getting um, a little bit tough for her, you know, other people notice that she misses the sea and like point her in that direction. And but Daphne hates the water. There's a scene in her training where she has to to do something in the water and she's you know she is full on not happy about about it and afraid and it, they do mention that her mother died at sea so that you know kind of explains why she would have a mistrust of it but there's lots of other ways the characters parallel like they both feel this great sense of duty um you know for for Daphne is um like she spent a lot of time in Paris and she really feels like she has this duty to restore France to the French people. And so she has that kind of sense of duty, but then Violet feels such a strong familial duty to look after, um, to look after her, her family. And she, I think she has some pretty significant survivor's guilt. And so, you know, there's the reasons behind that sense of duty is are, are very different, but they're both really strong parts of their personalities. I, I agree. And I think um, there's this great scene in Daphne's storyline where it's kind of a turning point for her, where she goes from feeling, wanting to impress her dad to really feeling this obligation towards France. And there's this one yeah. particular scene that is, it really was a powerful scene and it was really well written and um, she wasn't in it. She was observing it. And yet she, she still felt what was yeah, going it was on. Yeah. It's a whole shift in her perspective. It's almost right. like that growing up moment, right? Yeah. Well, and the distance I think made a difference. I think the, the fact that um, Jenny put it at a distance helped. Um, yeah. And because it dawns on me, 
one of the things that dawned on me of why I liked Daphne's over Violet's was because Daphne was a wholly fictional character. Um, you know, the fictional character, you can mold them to suit the story. They can have that major turning point that you use the events to make them change. Um, Cause you're in charge of the backstory and the motivation and all that. Whereas with a real person, and I've, I've said this before with fictional biographies, we all know I have a love hate relationship with them. Uh, we both do. Cause there are some really good ones and I don't want to like slam the whole thing. But I think that sometimes, and I think this was the case with um, this book because I've read other Jenny Walsh's books. Um, I think that it constrains you and it flattens the characterization. There wasn't, she couldn't really give us a lot of tension in Violet's story because we knew she survived. Oh, that, I mean, that yeah. was a, a matter of fact that she survived all these things. So yeah. there was no life or death. Whereas Daphne, we didn't know what she was going to do with the character. So right. we were a little more mystery. And I think that that's the problem. Now that said, Jenny did try to fix that. And I give her major props because she tweaked history just a bit. Um, and I won't say where, but she did do it <laughs> to kind of create a little more emotion and tension. Yeah. Um, Cause she understood, it's clear she understands that she's been constrained and says, okay, well I gotta do something. Cause otherwise it's just a series of events happening to this woman. Right, right. And, so and I give her props. I, I'd agree with that. Like when you're writing about a real person you're dealing with things that really happened as well as being sort of tasked with ascribing emotions to those, mm -hmm. to that person. And that's a really tough job. And maybe that's why you and I are both sort of on the fence about, you know, fictional biographies or, you know, any story that, that uses real, you know, people that really existed is that, you know, there are some that are done so very well. And then there are others that just feel like the writing is, is fine, but they just feel a little bit flat, like you said. And, and yeah, I like think it's they're just spitting out facts. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, they can, they can, try it a lot but it just doesn't quite hit that mark where you freak okay so a really good one will make you forget that you're reading about a real person and just get caught up in the character and so it's and then there are others that are that are well written but just doesn't quite take you to that level yes. and so that i think that's why you and i are really sort of hard <laughs> hard on those and i'll tell you it's 100 percent why i'm very um hesitant to um to not write just a straight up fictional character. Same with me. I know that that right now is very popular and a lot of readers love them. And yeah. there are some writers out there who do a marvelous job. And I think, like I said, I think Jenny did a good job because yeah. she did what she could. And you can tell that she understood her constraints and she tried to respect that. But at the yeah. same time, she's like, I gotta write a good story. It still has to be compelling, yeah. Right, and she, being a good writer, gave it enough elements to make it compelling. Yeah. She did want, there were some mysteries attached to Violet that you did want to find out. Right. And like the other thing, too, is that Violet's story starts in 1912, but it actually ends in 1946. The same, I think it's 46, the yeah. same as Daphne. Right. So that's a much longer scope rather than just being, you know, 1942 to 46. Right. Kind of and so, so much happened. She did have to shove a lot in. That's the other problem with yeah. history is you have to shove so much in, you know, and she you can't leave out a major yeah. event. If this woman had five major events, you can't leave one out. Yeah. I'm so. sorry, my nose is itchy. I think I like <laughs> had too many. I had too many cat snuggles today, and then I'm always like, um, okay. yeah, super lots, lots of cat snuggles happening here these days. Lots of fur, but it's lovely. Um, sorry, I totally went off. That's okay. So, there. Final verdict. Um, okay, so you know, my only complaint is actually there were a few times when some modern words or phrases crept in, and I noticed them. Um, but you know that's really really minor otherwise i really enjoyed this book uh my next book that i'm writing is titanic based so reading about violet was really neat for me and and actually it was really neat seeing her interact with like first class passengers and how they talked about the first class passengers because what i notice with a lot of titanic set stories right now is that it is um, usually the working class point of view. It's not from the point of view of someone in first class. So, um, so yeah, I I um, I found that really neat, and I found the story arcs compelling. Like even though I preferred Daphne's, I did find both of them compelling. Um, so it's a recommended read from me. Me too. Me too. Um, this is the second book I read by her. I read Call of the Wrens, which if you haven't read, you will really enjoy. 
Um, oh, good, because I haven't read that one yet. Yeah, no, that was a really fun read, too. Um, a couple things. When, one, I didn't notice the terms until you told me, which tells me that I was engrossed in the story. Okay. So one of the things that I um, rate a fictional biography on is how much it makes me go look up more stuff. And this, <laughs> set me down, this sent me down a lot of rabbit holes because I was really interested in learning more about Violet Jessup. And um, I found this website that like these people go into detail, like this Titanic organization that's really oh, into Titanic. I sent them a link. They went lifeboat by lifeboat and like person by person. Oh, like, yeah. oh that is a treasure trove. I, that's a treasure trove of and information. I was, and I was like, first. and they have one all about, they had like a whole thing on Jenny, uh, not Jenny, on um, Violet Jessup and the, the part uh, of the yeah. story that Jenny used. They have a yeah, whole- Yeah, called Encyclopedia Titanica. I was loving it. So, yeah. um, and the other thing that I, I will say is Jenny's, um, in her other writing life, she writes young adult. And I think that comes across in this book because it's not mm -hmm. super gritty. It's not super dark. I mean, there's emotion, but it's not. I, and there is, there is detail. Like it doesn't shy away from it and make it fluffy, oh, but it's no, not, it's, it's, but it's not gritty. Right. And sometimes you don't want a gritty read. I mean, I've just finished a bunch of them where they were kind of hard and dark and, you know, yeah. awful, sad things happened. And this was a little bit lighter in that I didn't hear descriptions of torture and I didn't, get, right. <laughs> you know, there wasn't a lot of blood and gore. People died, but off screen, you know. Yeah. And it was, she didn't, it wasn't dark. It was yeah. an enjoyable read. and. Yeah. But because she writes young adult, I think that that also comes into it. Then it's a much, um, she isn't, there's not a lot of profanity. There's not a lot of sex in her books, all of that. I mean, for Call the Wrench was the same way. And I worked at Barnes and Noble and someone came in and said they had a young teenage girl and was interested in historical fiction. She's the type of book that I would, she's the type of author that I would use to introduce young teenagers to historical fiction. Yeah. I would, because it's well-written, it's well-researched and it's not, too much for somebody yeah and so i definitely recommend it for everybody but if you're a parent and you have a teenager and you want to say hey you want to read a really good historical fiction she's the, she's someone i would recommend yep all right so recommended read from both of us yes yes awesome all right so why don't you let us know what's up next for us well for me it's a week in the keys <laughs> I know. And I just wanted you to have to say that and then like everybody hate you because you're going to spend a week in the Florida Keys. I am. I'm heading to Key Largo in a couple days. But actually, I'm kind of bummed because our feature author is going to be Glynis Peters, yeah. who is going to be talking about her latest release, The Orphan Homecoming, but she's got a trilogy. It's called the um, Red Cross Orphans Trilogy, right? Is that? Yes. And she happens to be with your publisher, which is kind of fun. She is. And yeah. she's so she's kind of a rising star. I recognized her name because her books are on a lot of shelves. And um, she's older. She's an older author, yep. and I am all for older female authors. And uh, they don't get nearly enough attention. So she's a retired nurse, and now she's a writer. I'm kind of bummed because I really would have liked to have talked with her. She sounds like a very interesting woman. So you get to interview her. Well, you'll have to, you'll and have I'm, to tune in. I will. I will have to either tune in or watch the recording. I may be on a boat. It's kind of hard to tune in on a boat and you'd all hate me. Yeah, well. <laughs> I'll be sailing. <laughs> um, and then in February, we have our book. We are going to do Frozen River by Ariel Lawhon. I hope I pronounced it right. It's L-A-W-H-O-N. Yes. Um, and it's a post-revolutionary war book based in Maine, which I'm excited about. I think it kind of has a murder mystery attached to it. And it's out of World War II, people. Yay! Not that I don't know. <laughs> well, don't get me wrong. I love, I'm writing World War II, but. I know. I it's, love, it's nice because it's change of pace. Well, and I love giving, like the same thing with Unsinkable. I love kind of giving a nod to unusual historical periods. Yeah. And so this, I'm really excited about. It appeals to the daughter of American Revolution in me. And better yet, this was suggested because we're going to have a guest. Our friend Sydney Young from HF Chit Chat is coming on. Yeah. And uh, she's the one that suggested it. So please check our Facebook and Instagram for um, book de broadcast details. And we'll put the link to the book in the show notes. But she read it. And she's going to reread it because she said it was one of the best books she read last year. Um, yeah. I can't wait. Very excited. Me either. I'm looking forward to both those broadcasts. Um, first with Glennis and then 
Um, having Sid come back, I just I love any time that we get to spend time with Sid. I'm a happy girl. She's lovely, she wonderful. Um, and the book looks really good. And it's probably not one I would have picked up um, on my own, but Sid does a good job picking books. So, <laughs> so. Yeah, well, that's why we had her suggested. Actually, people should know yeah, she's yeah. the one that picked Joan last year, which I never would have picked up. And it no. turned out to be one of my favorite reads of 2022. And so Joan I'm all over letting her choose. Yeah, no, Sid's great. So. So yes, we will um, we'll put the link to the book in the show notes so that people can read along with us. And uh, you can always find us on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash groups slash step into the story. Yep. Or on YouTube at, and also on Instagram, same handle, which is at yeah. step into the story books. That's right. And uh, we encourage you to do that because we pop in from now and now and again, like my cat. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's dinner time here for uh, the cats. That's why. That's so funny. <laughs> um, we pop in with uh, recommendations in between, and we'll give you updates on the reading challenge, all sorts of stuff. Sounds good. So have a great time with Glennis Peters. Sorry, I miss have you all. Have a great all. time in the Keys. I will post pictures. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. See you later. Bye bye.